Hey everybody, this is Greg Unruh. I'm with Global Leadership Academy and we're gonna have our first segment today on geomimicry. So, uh, anybody who's been in, immersed in the world of sustainability or interested in sustainable business has probably heard of biomimicry. Uh, biomimicry is often defined as the design and manufacture of products inspired by nature. And it's a powerful design philosophy. Um, but behind this idea of biomimicry is a riddle. And it's an implicit recognition that our current approaches to production uh, don't mimic nature. Uh, and that leaves the question, you know, what is behind our current approach to manufacturing? Um, and so that was a question that was actually posed to me by a participant in an executive education program I was running for chief sustainability officers. And you know, these are smart people and smart people ask smart questions. And someone asked to me that, you know, what is the opposite of biomimicry? If not, we're not doing biomimicry, what are we doing? And I was stumped for a minute and I was sitting there scratching my head and starting to feel a little bit embarrassed. Uh, and then all of a sudden I just blurted out geomimicry. Uh, and what we are engaged in is geomimicry. Every time we chisel a brick, every time we forge an iron beam, every time we do something even like distilling a hydrocarbon, we're engaging of acts of geomimicry. Geomimicry is the human imitation of physical geological processes in the design and manufacture of products and services. And geomimicry has been the basis of human industry and the basis of our material creativity since our prehistoric ancestors, since you know, the first human being out there picked up a rock and used it, used it to hammer open a femur to get at the bone marrow inside, that's the very beginning of geomimicry. In modern industrial world, uh, and our successes as a, spe uh, as a species even, um, have been based on geomimicry. Geomimicry has allowed us to dominate the planet. Um, and that's also part of the challenge. Um, because geomimicry is so embedded, it actually predates writing, uh, we're pretty much unaware of it. And before we were using fire or speaking, we were engaging in geomimicry. It's always been there and it's always been there, right? It's, it's, it's there now and it's always been there. And so um, we fail to recognize it. Um, but I think recognizing geomimicry is crucial to addressing the sustainability challenges facing us. Uh, and it's crucial that we understand what we're doing if we want to transform our manufacturing approaches, transform businesses, and transform our society to a verdant, more prosperous, and equitable world. All right. So to understand geomimicry, we're going to have to understand our planet's physical systems and how they operate. Uh, and this might take you back to your, you know, your high school earth science class or geology class or something like that. But as if you remember, the planet is in a constant cycle of construction and deconstruction or uh, construction and destruction. The earth is continuously fabri fabricating new rocks. Uh, and then at the same time, up on the surface of the, the planet, the, the, the processes are constantly wearing those rocks back down. We don't perceive it uh, generally because it happens on time scales that are imperceptible less. You know, we measure human lifespan in years, you measure, measure the, the lifespan of geologic processes in eons, in millions of years. So how exactly are we geomimicry? What are we doing that we can consider geomimicry? Um, so at the most basic level, we mimic the Earth's physical weathering processes, the, the subtractive manufacturing processes that we see evidenced all over the planet, right? Mountains to us seem like permanent features of the landscape, but they're not. Uh, there are physical forces that are constantly wearing them down all the time. Wind, rain, and ice are constantly breaking up rocks and washing away the landscape. And we call this process physical weathering. So the Grand Canyon, like you see here, was cut by running water. Uh, it just happened to be working over million year time frames. You give a river enough time and it can weather a Grand Canyon. All right, wind is also a powerful force, uh, and these are wind sculpted rocks that you can find here in, uh, in this example in the deserts of Bolivia. All right, so these processes are constantly wearing down, subtracting material, and creating these interesting uh, shapes and forms that we see as geomorphology on the landscape. But wind and water, of course, are just instruments of gravity, and gravity on its own can pull down huge chunks of the landscape. Um, cliffs are carved by the spontaneously slumping of rocks or by avalanches, uh, and they can actually reshape big you know, chunks of the planet's surface, like the, the, this image you see here. Right? 
Um, so geomimicry for human beings begins with mimicking this process of, of phys physical weathering, this subtractive process of breaking and chipping things away, right? The first human remnants, the first artifacts that we have are examples of geomimicry. These here are Clovis points, our prehistoric tool uh, made by North American natives uh, 13,000 years ago, and they're found all over the continent of North America, right? Um, but we got started with geomimicry really, really early. The oldest tools ever discovered, um, you can see them here, they're 2.5 million years old. Uh, it's just amazing. But ancient peoples living in modern day Ethiopia were using these things to chop and scrape meat from animal bones. All right. Over time, of course, our techniques and tools have uh, evolved and become more refined. Um, but really, there's still the subtractive process of, of mimicking nature's physical weathering processes, right? And any time we are shaping an object by carving, by whittling, by washing or grinding away materials, we're mimicking the geologic processes of physical weathering. Uh, Michelangelo famously said, uh, I saw an angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. He's describing uh, geomimicry, subtractive uh, manufacturing process, you know, so physical weathering produces an object, often stunningly beautiful objects, by the progressive removal or by the subtraction of material over time, which is fundamental to a, a, a huge swath of human manufacturing approaches, right? But nature doesn't only do subtraction, it also does addition, where things are built up by uh, additional uh, geologic processes. So this here is a stratovolcano. Uh, it's a very well-developed volcano in Chile. And this is built by uh, a process over a very long time frames of adding layer upon layer of lava and ash until we build up this beautiful volcano, right? So um, humans are also mimicking this additive manufacturing processes. Uh, and, you know, humans began doing this early on. The first sort of evidence that we have ad of additive manufacturing is, is um, about 24,000 years ago. The earliest artifacts we can find are human and animal figurines that were formed out of mud and clay and then of course left out in the sun to dry and harden. Um, so people uh, soon began, you know, with pottery uh, and other kinds of, uh, of, of, you know, of molding of, of clays and other materials began sort of an additive process of geomimicry. Um, but we soon began then to, to intensify the geomimicry by mimicking not only the additive process but the intense heat and pressures found uh, deep in the planets to actually modify the physical structure of the clays, right? So these are just plain old sun-dried bricks. You can form bricks like this and leave them out in the sun and, the, and uh, it's a mixture of clay and straw and you get a beautiful brick, you know, that works really well. And this is still done in many parts of the world today. But what humans found is that if you intensify the heat, if you had lots of heat, you actually would transform the min mineral clay materials into things that were more glass-like, more ceramic-like, by subjecting them to intense heat. And we get, over time, our methods and our abilities to do this, our, our kilns um, began more, uh, became more sophisticated, uh, and we learned how to intensify, control, and direct the heat. Um, but, you know, no matter how sophisticated, this is actually a model of a, uh, of a Roman kiln, but no matter, you know, how primitive or sophisticated, in the end, all we're really doing is imitating the geological processes that are responsible for creating, forming, and metamorphosing rocks and minerals uh, when we deal with ceramics and other types of things. So, uh, it's not limited, of course, to ceramics. Uh, metal use has also have a very long history. We began first by pounding and, uh, and shaping raw carp co copper and things about 10,000 years ago. Um, but metal making, especially in the industrial period, depends upon generating plutonic geologic conditions up here on the earth. Melting rock is not an easy feat. It requires temperatures uh, of 15,000 degrees centigrade. You know, that's thousands of times hotter than the hottest days uh, in, in Phoenix, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So um, this types of heat and pressure is not found up here on the surface. It's not found up here in the biosphere. It's only found at great depths. And so we have to mimic those, create those conditions uh, here on the, on the surface and use it for our human industrial purposes. All right. So uh, heating and forming uh, metal, uh, metals and, and minerals where we're, we're using the human forges of industry, um, but what we're really doing is just aping 
these Hadean forges uh, that are found at great depths, right? And another form of uh, geomimicry. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Even our world of plastics, of our, our world of fuels and gasoline, our fuels of pharmaceuticals, our, the world of you know, medicines and, 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 and other types of pharmaceuticals, all based on geomimicry. Industrial chemical manufacturing is again replicating and, the, and controlling the forces and conditions that only occur naturally at great geologic depths. We're doing it, of course, up here on the surface. So much of the work of a chemical plant is using heat and pressure to fractionate or, or break up, up hydrocarbons, break up oil into components. So to create things like diesel, kerosene, or gasoline. And then other processes are used to recombine those to make things like plastics or pharmaceutical chemicals or other types of chemicals, right? And again, these processes are found, are, do happen on Earth, but they only happen at great depth where there's lots of pressure from that overlying rock squeezing things and then the heat coming up from, uh, from below. Um, so petrochemicals, everything about uh, the, 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 the plastic world, again, it's just another instance of geomimicry. And then, of course, even nuclear power is uh, geomimicry. Um, most of the heat of the interior, the heat that creates volcanoes, the heat that drives plate tectonics, is actually nuclear power. It's radiogenic heat decay from the decay of radioactive elements like uranium and thorium. Uh, and what we do then is uh, in, replicate those conditions up here on the planet of the Earth, concentrate them, uh, and do it in a controlled way to generate the heat we need to generate the steam and run the turbine and, and provide the electricity uh, and power. And again, we're just replicating up here processes that happen um, deep inside the Earth's surface. Um, so geomimicry is pervasive. It describes most of our uh, industrial manufacturing processes. And for those of us interested in sustainability, I think it's really important that we begin to recognize geomimicry and, and recognize where it comes from. Because as we'll see in the next segment, geomimicry is also responsible for most of the sustainability challenges we face. So I will look forward to talking with you about that in our next segment.